Our guest today has worked as a member of the Horticulture Department at Iowa State University since 1984. For years, he has provided home horticulture information to gardeners and, and county extension staff in the state of Iowa. He could probably speak to us about any gardening topic that you can imagine, but today we're going to ask Richard Geron to talk to us about shade gardening. Please welcome Richard Geron. Thank you. You should have a uh, kind of a silver colored sheet and we're going to discuss some of the uh, perennials and trees and shrubs that do well in partial to heavy shade. And before starting, I have a commercial. <laughs> we have a new booklet on perennials for shade that just came out. Uh, you can pick it up at your county extension office. It's in full color, a very nice publication, uh, $5 per copy. We also have one for perennials for sun. So we have perennials for shade, perennials for sun, uh, coming out in about a month or so, uh, annuals, and also deciduous shrubs. Uh, the same format, uh, about 40 pages or so. Very nice. Could I have the lights? Okay, here we have the typical site where the owner is trying desperately to grow grass. Okay, bluegrass just doesn't do well in the shade. And so you end up with a little bit of grass, a lot of dirt, a lot of soil, maybe a few violets. But most grasses just don't do well in the shade. But if you choose the right annuals and perennials and trees and shrubs, this can be a very, very attractive site. And the first group will be the perennials. And this kind of describes what partial shade is. Partial shade is where you may get two or three hours of sun during the day. Here we have a honey locust tree. They have very fine little leaflets. And so you have a, a nice filtered shade. So during the day, those sites may get two or three hours of sun. So it's basically partial shade. And so we have some impatiens and some hostas. And if you follow your list, uh, the first one that we have here would be the cultivated columbines. Uh, these are very colorful. Uh, oftentimes they can be one single color, but most often you have a white center and the outer part might be red, blue, purple, yellow. And you have those very distinctive uh, spurs that point backward on the flowers. Now the cultivated columbines tend to be short-lived typically three, four, or five years, and they die out. So they're not long-term, they're not like peonies or daylilies. These are fairly short life, maybe three, four, or five years. They like a moist, well-drained soil, and if they have that, they'll be very nice for a, for a few years. Here we have the native columbine. The wild columbine should be blooming maybe in a week or two in central Iowa. Uh, very distinctive flowers. They hang down, they're nodding flowers, a red and yellow. Uh, very, very easy to grow. If you take a walk in the woods, you'll see these typically growing on exposed rocky soils. Very, very uh, common in Iowa. Now, as far as planting this in the home landscape, it's probably more suitable for more of a natural area because the wild ones reseed very, very freely. And if you like a nice, neat garden, you'll have these seeds coming up all over the place. And for some people, that's annoying and kind of a, a weed. But if you have a natural setting where it can reseed itself and spread naturally, terrific. Uh, a very pretty plant. Here we have a goat's beard. This one is the dwarf Korean goat's beard. Only grows about a foot tall. Makes a nice little uniform mound. A very, very finely cut foliage mainly grown for the actual appearance. Very, very nice mound, very attractive foliage. And then you have these creamy white flowers that appear in midsummer. Dwarf Korean goat spear. Here's a more common one uh, that gets to be four to five, six feet tall. The common goat spear, actually native to Iowa. But a big plant uh, can get to be six foot tall, 
So it should be in the back of a border. Uh, basically, it's not something in front. It's a big, big plant. It really likes a moist soil, a well-drained soil. And then you have these creamy white flowers, typically late spring and summer. A common goat's beard, but a big plant. The astilbes, a, a very big group of plants that do well in partial shade, uh, mainly grown for the flowers. They can be white, pink, reddish or reddish purple. And the actual flower stalk may be fairly upright and stiff, or maybe more of an arching plume that kind of hangs over. Uh, the foliage can be green or kind of a bronze green. But as far as growing the plants, they, they do like partial shade, but they do require a moist, well-drained soil. They do not like dry conditions. They do not tolerate dry conditions very well at all. Uh, the last couple of years in Ames, we've had some very dry weather, and, and my astilbes, they scorch if you don't water them. Uh, if they get dry, uh, they scorch very, very quickly. So they do need that moist soil. They really don't tolerate dry conditions very well. And here's a white form. But many, many, many varieties, uh, but they really do need that moist soil. Here's a tuberous begonia, a tender perennial. And uh, they actually do best typically in containers, pots, window boxes. Uh, when you put them in the ground, they typically don't perform as well. But if you put them in a container, if you have a good, well-drained soil, uh, they can be very, very attractive plants. Uh, this one is some type of uh, non-stop begonia. Uh, very, very uh, nice plants. They also like to have some shelter from strong winds. They would not do well on a day like today. <laughs> they do not like strong winds. They, the stems can get to be quite large, like an inch, maybe inch and a half across, and they're quite brittle. So they need that partial shade, and they also need some protection from the strong winds. They don't really like those conditions at all. Here's a red, uh, here's a red lace. And with the tuberous begonias, it's, it's kind of interesting. They actually have two flowers on the plant when you look at them. They have two flowers. They have male flowers and female flowers. Uh, the female flowers are typically smaller and not as showy. The male flowers are much bigger and more showy. So they have those two different types. Uh, this is a tender perennial. Uh, you do have to dig it up in the, in the fall, bring it inside if you want to keep it. But it's actually very, very easy to store indoors. You just wait till you have a killing frost or freeze. You dig up the actual tuber, and it is a tuber in the ground. You let it dry for about a week, and then you bury the tuber in vermiculite, like in a small box or something, and then store the tubers in a cool, dry place, like around 40, 45, 50. And then they should be fine. I typically take mine out of the uh, containers about <coughs> mid-March, and then pot them up. And then they'll give me a nice plant to set outside in May. Uh, this one here is red lace, is the, is the actual variety. Uh, this one here is, the common name is pig squeak, or Virginia. Pig squeak or Virginia. It has these large, dark green, shiny leaves in the summer. And then, in the fall, they take on kind of a reddish cast. And then in the spring, they send up these fairly short but stout flower stalks. And the flowers are typically a nice pink. Virginia or pig squeak. Now, very, very attractive when they're in bloom, but they don't bloom reliably every spring. Some years they really bloom very nicely. Other years, hardly anything. And then so it's not always reliable, but when they're in bloom, very, very attractive plants. Virginia or pig squeak. As far as the common name, if you take a leaf and put it between your thumb and forefinger and rub, it squeaks like a pig. <coughs> pig squeak. Heartleaf bernera uh, blooms typically in the spring in a few weeks. A nice blue color. Blues are kind of hard to come by as far as a true blue. These have small blue, forget-me-not-like flowers. 
very, very pretty. They also insist on a moist, well-drained soil. They do not like dry conditions at all. So again, it should be a moist soil. Uh, the leaves are heart-shaped, hence heartleaf bernera as far as the common name. Uh, the actual leaves are covered with very short, very stiff little hairs. So it has a very coarse texture, almost like sandpaper as far as the actual foliage. Anyway, as far as the new varieties on the hardleaf bernera, many of those have a silver on their foliage, uh, where they have silver spots, or maybe the majority of the leaf is silver with maybe a green margin. Uh, they're not as vigorous as a normal green form, but they're quite popular in the nursery trade. Here we have bugbane, semisifuga, bugbane. Grows about four or five feet tall. And the very top you have this white candle-like flower, bugbane. <coughs> Moving to the bleeding hearts, the bleeding hearts, dicentra. Uh, this one here, this species is a fringed bleeding heart, a fairly nice mound type plant, about a foot tall, kind of grayish blue foliage, and little pink flowers. Uh, this plant dies back in the fall with the first frost. But this one here is the more common one. It's the old-fashioned bleeding heart, currently blooming in central Iowa. And you have these arching stems and you have these red and white heart-shaped flowers hanging down from that arching stem. Uh, very elegant, very attractive. Um, this can be a fairly large plant. If it's an older plant, maybe three foot tall, maybe three, four feet wide, but, but very, very elegant, very attractive. There's also a white form, Alba, where the, white, where the flower is completely white. Uh, not as vigorous though, as the uh, species, but still very, very attractive, very interesting. Now the old-fashioned bleeding heart, it does die back naturally by early to mid-summer. That's perfectly normal. So they'll die back by early to mid-summer. If we have a dry year, they'll, dry back, they'll die back even sooner. But it's perfectly normal for them to die back by early to mid-summer. Uh, shooting star, native to Iowa. Uh, you'll find this in prairies, but you'll also find these in partial shade. And uh, when you look at the flower, uh, the petals are are pointed backward and upward, so it kind of looks like a shooting star or a badminton birdie, that same kind of a appearance. Uh, the actual flowers can be white, pink, or kind of a pinkish purple. And this plant is native to Iowa, easy to grow, uh, sun or partial shade. Uh, the plant will die back though by early to midsummer typically. Barren wart, a nice ground cover for partial shade. Grows about a foot tall. It does spread, but not invasively at all. So it will make a nice ground cover, very uniform. You have these heart-shaped leaves, and oftentimes in the spring, they have kind of a bronze or a red cast to the foliage. And then they have these small little columbine-like flowers that can be white, yellow, pink, or red. So barren wart or epimedium, a nice ground cover, does tolerate sh uh, dry conditions quite well. So if you have a dry, shady spot, you need a ground cover, you might try this. It really likes a moist soil, but it's very, very tolerant of dry soils. Crested iris, crested iris, low growing, maybe six, seven, eight inches tall. And then you have these blue to purple flowers, typically with a yellow crest on the petals, crested iris. You could use this as a ground cover and partial shade also, crested iris. <coughs> Mardigan lilies are Turk's cap lily. Uh, these actually do, most lilies prefer full sun but the Maragon lilies or the Turk's cap lilies prefer partial shade. A uh, couple of di very distinctive things about these type, they have these Turk's cap shaped flowers and they also have leaves in whorls where you have a stem and then several leaves 
then a stem and several leaves. Very distinctive. So you have that Turk's cap lily as far as the shape of the flower, and then you have leaves and whorls. The flowers can be white, pink, orange, or a kind of a dark red. And here's the white form. Uh, the flowers hang down, kind of the nodding flower. Um, very, very attractive. Now these are also fairly expensive in comparison to the other, your common garden lilies. Uh, these are more like 10 to 15 dollars per bulb. So they're fairly expensive. But they're very, very attractive, especially if you have partial shade, because that's where they really do well. Creeping lily turf. Creeping lily turf, it's a perennial, has grass-like foliage, and then typically in, in mid to late summer has these small little flowers, not terribly showy, but they vary from white to a pale violet. Um, they do spread, so it could be used as a ground cover. Again, tolerates dry conditions, so if you have a dry, shady spot, you want a ground cover, you might try creeping lily turf. If you go down south, like in Georgia, Tennessee, lily turf is everywhere as a ground cover. I mean, it's very, very commonly used. But this species here is hardy in Iowa. Now, the actual foliage is evergreen. It does persist through the winter. But usually by late winter, it looks pretty tattered and torn. And you might have some winter burn as far as some browning of it. So I just typically cut it back to the ground, and it comes right back up. So creeping lily turf. Cardinal flower, native to Iowa, uh, typically found at the woodland edge where it gets some sun um, and these bright red flowers. It does need a moist soil. It does need that. Not very drought tolerant. In fact, this will grow pretty well in full sun if you have good moisture in the soil. So they really do need that moisture. Cardinal flower. Lobelia. Uh, this is woodland phlox. Should be blooming shortly in central Iowa. Uh, the, the flowers vary from white to blue to purple. Most commonly this light blue. Woodland phlox. And if you take a hike in the woods, you may run across a huge drift of these in bloom. Very, very attractive. Woodland phlox. The rabbits, though, do unfortunately love this plant. And so I have a problem growing this because my rabbits will chew it right down to the ground. Woodland phlox. Here's another phlox. And the uh, common name is creeping phlox. But it's not the same thing that you commonly see with the narrow needle-like foliage. This one has more of an oval leaf. But it has, the scientific name is phlox stolonifera. It has above ground stems that grow out. And as they grow, they root and keep on growing. So hence, creeping phlox, phlox dolonifera. And the leaves are more oval in shape. Uh, they hug the ground, so they're kind of a nice ground cover. They do bloom in the spring. And the flowers can be white, blue, purple, or pink. So you don't see this, this one as nearly as common as the other creeping phlox. But this one likes partial shade. The other one prefers full sun. Yep. <laughs> yeah, in fact, uh, one year, the actual leaves are evergreen, and so they persist through the winter. And so the following spring, when there was no food around, uh, they chewed it right down to the ground. And so it didn't bloom that year at all. So here's a bulb. It's Siberian squill. And it blooms typically around early to mid-April in central Iowa. In Ames, it's basically just getting done blooming. And uh, you have these nice dark blue flowers. Uh, we have a hillside on campus by the president's house. It's a wooded area. And the hillside is just a sea of blue in the spring. Very, very, very pretty. Very showy. Um, typically lasts about a week or maybe 10 days. Very pretty. Uh, the actual bulbs, you do plant them in the fall. Uh, they're very inexpensive as far as the bulbs. And once you plant those, uh, after they're done blooming, they form a seed pod or capsule that splits open. 
and spills out the seed. And so they do spread quite nicely on their own, very nicely. Now these plants bloom in the spring very early, and the actual plants die back by early June typically. So they come up very early before the trees are fully leafed out. They flower, produce their seed, and then die back as the trees leaf out. So they get everything done very, very quickly. That's how they do well in the shady uh, locations. But very pretty. A uh, foam flower. Uh, the flowers can be white or kind of a pale pink. And the actual leaves typically have a shape more like a maple leaf or an oak leaf. Foam flower. Moving to heavy shade. Uh, these areas may not get any direct sunlight during the day. For example, if you have a large hard maple, like a sugar maple, very dense canopy, large leaves, very little light will penetrate that canopy. Or if you have a big linden tree, again, very little light will penetrate that canopy. And so you have to choose plants that will tolerate heavy, dense shade. Here we have red baneberry, which is native to Iowa. Red baneberry. It has little flowers that are not very showy, but after flowering, it forms these berry-like fruit that turn a dark, bright red. Red baneberry. There's also a white baneberry with white fruit. Uh, one word of caution, though, uh, the fruit are poisonous, and you should be aware of that. Uh, they are poisonous. So red baneberry. It's native to Iowa. Does best in a moist, well-drained soil in heavy shade. Here we have a fern, northern maidenhair fern, also native to Iowa. And this fern is different than most ferns. Most ferns have these large, coarse fronds. This has a more delicate, lacy frond, so a different appearance. Northern maidenhair fern, native to Iowa. Like most ferns, it prefers a moist, well-drained soil. Most ferns are not very drought tolerant, so a moist, well-drained soil. Now this one goes by various common names, and I kind of hesitate to mention it because it's extremely aggressive. Um, you have to use this very, very carefully if you choose to plant it. It goes by the name of uh, gout weed or bishop's weed, and it is very pretty. It has kind of a medium green leaf with a creamy white edge. It will grow in shade. It will grow in sun. It will grow in very poor soil, so it's very, very adaptable as far as growing. But it does spread very quickly by underground stems or rhizomes, very, very rapidly. And I would only use this where you can confine it to a certain area. Otherwise, if you put this in with other perennials, it tends to crowd them out very quickly. So for example, if you have a place between, let's say, a sidewalk and a building in the shade, this might be a good choice for that site. Or if you have this big tree, nothing grow underneath it, you can plant this underneath that tree and, and basically leave it as that one plant. But I wouldn't mix it in with other perennials. It's too aggressive. It's actually in the carrot family. It flowers, but the flowers are, are not showy at all. Here we have a juga, or bugle weed. A nice low growing ground cover for the shade. Uh, the species has a green leaf and a blue flower. We commonly grow varieties that have colorful foliage, where they're more showy. And this one here is burgundy glow, a very common variety with a little bit of burgundy, a little bit of creamy white, some color. And the flowers themselves, they can be blue, pink, or white. And the flowers themselves are also very showy in the spring. Jack in the pulpit, native to Iowa, a woodland plant. You'll typically find this in moist woodland sites. And it comes up early in the spring. Typically you have two, three leaflet leaves. And in the center, you have the separate flower stalk. And the flower stalk has a club-like spadix in the center. That's Jack, or the preacher. Then it has the leaf-like spathe that curves up and over the spadix. That's the pulpit, hence Jack in the pulpit, as far as the common name. Uh, the flowers can be green, they can be kind of a purplish brown, or they can be striped. 
but very, very common in Iowa, jack in the pulpit. And after blooming, it does form this cluster of berries, and they turn a bright orangey red by late summer. So most people don't really notice the actual plant itself until they see the fruit. A very, very bright, showy, orangey red. Now once they do this, uh, typically the critters will find them and they'll usually eat those quite quickly. So they don't last very long once they do ripen, but very, very showy as far as the fruit. Jack in the pulpit. Another native plant, wild ginger. Wild ginger should be blooming right about now in central Iowa. You have these medium green leaves that are kind of shaped like a, like a kidney. You have two leaves per plant, and typically you have a small little kind of brownish or maroon flower near the base. Wild ginger. Uh, you can actually use this as a ground cover in deep shade. Wild ginger. Here we have the European species where the leaf is much darker green and very, very shiny, kind of leathery. So we here, here we have the European species. Now as far as the, uh, the common name ginger, um, the early settlers did not have the true ginger. And if you dig up the rhizomes on this plant, they do have a ginger-like fragrance. And they would use that in some of their cooking, hence wild ginger. Here's another fern, Japanese painted fern, something that has some color. It's not the typical fern. Here you have some gray, some green, and a little bit of maroon or burgundy. So you have some color. Japanese painted fern. And like all ferns, they like a moist, well-drained soil. Here's another plant that really should have kind of a caution with it, just like the goat's beard. A lily of the valley. Again, it spreads very, very aggressively by underground stems or rhizome. And so again, you really need to confine this to a certain area. Otherwise, it's too invasive. It really is. It's very pretty. It has attractive foliage. Then it has these white bell-shaped flowers in the spring. Very fragrant. Uh, but uh, again, very, very aggressive. It spreads very quickly. Uh, I have a large patch in my backyard, which was there when I bought the house. <coughs> And I have to go out there periodically with my Roundup and my spade, basically to confine the plants to that area. Otherwise, it will spread into the hostas and wherever. So you really do have to confine these. Uh, Dutchman's breeches, also native to Iowa, where you have these kind of grayish green leaves, kind of fern-like in appearance. And then you have these white flowers in the spring. And they're shaped like white pantaloons. They're white, and then you have those kind of a yellow belt line. So Dutchman's breeches. A sweet woodruff. A nice ground cover for the shade. Grows about six to eight inches tall. Uh, leaves and whorls, and then you have these white flowers in the spring. Sweet woodruff. If you cut this and crush the plant tissue, it has a very strong fragrance, like newly cut hay. So it's quite fragrant. In fact, they use this quite a bit in potpourris. Sweet woodruff. Also, they use this to fl uh, favor, uh, flavor May wines, too, on occasion. So sweet woodruff. A nice ground cover for the shade. Hostas. If you've got shade, you've got to have some hostas. Uh, there are hundreds of varieties. And, and they're quite diverse. Uh, they vary from like three to four inches in height up to maybe three to four feet in height. Uh, they vary in color from greens, blues, golds, and various combinations of colors. Uh, they vary in flower color. They can be white, blue, or purple. And actually, some have very fragrant flowers, like Heaven Scent, Royal Standard, where they have very fragrant flowers. So it's not always just the foliage, but sometimes they have nice, attractive flowers. Very easy to grow, low maintenance. Uh, this one here is Francie, a very common variety, kind of a dark green with a creamy white edge. Most of the hostas do best in partial shade to heavy shade as a group. Here we have a blue one, Blue Angel, a fairly big variety. If you have an older plant, it might be three foot tall, maybe three, four foot wide. 
So a very big blue one. Now the blue ones develop their best color in heavy shade. They'll grow fine in partial shade. But in partial shade, they'll be more green than blue. So if the blue ones, if you want that nice blue coloration, put them in heavy shade. And the reason for that is the blue varieties have a waxy layer on the leaf surface. And that waxy layer reflects blue wavelengths of light. So therefore they appear to be blue. If you put them in partial shade, that waxy layer kind of dissipates. And so they appear to be green. So if you really want that nice blue coloration, put the blue varieties in heavy shade. They'll do fine in partial shade, but they'll be more green than blue. And then we have the gold varieties. Uh, this one here is gold standard. When it first comes up, it's kind of a bright yellow green with a dark green edge. But by summer, it typically turns gold with a dark green edge. This one's gold standard. Now the gold varieties, most of these actually prefer partial sun, where they get maybe three, four, or five hours of sun to really get that nice gold color. If you put these in heavy shade, they'll grow fine, but they'll be more of a yellow green, not a gold color. So most of the gold ones prefer at least three, four, or five hours of sun to really get that nice gold color. And if we have a really hot, dry summer, they'll scorch. They really were. They, they really will. So uh, you may have to water these on occasion because if they get too much sun and they're dry, they will scorch. So you may have to water these on occasion. A yellow Archangel. Yellow Archangel, another ground cover. You could use this in a dry situation. They do tolerate dry conditions quite well. And you have this green and silver variegated foliage and a yellow flower. Yellow archangel. A spotted dead nettle. Spotted dead nettle, another ground cover for the shade. Grows about six, eight inches tall. The species has kind of a green leaf with kind of a gray midrib and a pale pink flower. But we usually grow varieties that are more colorful, like white uh, Nancy or Beacon Silver, where the foliage is essentially white or silver with a dark green edge. But a nice ground cover for this shade. Spotted dead nettle. Another fern, ostrich fern. Probably the most common fern that we see in Iowa. Uh, very common around older homes. Very, very easy to grow. Ostrich fern. Uh, Virginia bluebells, currently blooming here in central Iowa, native to Iowa, uh, very, very attractive. Uh, the buds are kind of pink, but when they actually bloom, they're a nice light blue, very, very showy, very easy to grow. And here's a close-up, uh, blooming right now. Uh, they come up early in the spring, they bloom, and then they die back typically by early to mid-June, so they're gone. So again, they get up early, they bloom, and then they die back before the trees and shrubs are fully leafed out. So they very, do very well in these shady areas. Um, if you have the right site, they will reseed themselves quite nicely and spread. They like a moist, well-drained site. And if you have that, they'll spread very nicely. <coughs> Virginia bluebells. Uh, Solomon seal, also native to Iowa, where you have this long, arching, unbranched stem that comes out of the soil commonly th two to three feet long, but can be up to four to five feet long. And then you have these little flowers that hang down from the leaf axils, kind of a creamy uh, color, followed by little marble-shaped fruit that turn kind of a bluish purple by late summer. Solomon seal. Uh, I would probably plant this in more of a natural area because it comes up from seed very freely and again, becomes kind of annoying in a nice landscape. Um, so you may want to put this in more of a natural area. And instead, maybe grow this one here, the variegated form. The variegated form is a little more attractive. It has a creamy white edge to it. And it doesn't produce nearly as many fruit. So it doesn't receive itself nearly as freely as the uh, native species. So here you have a variegated Solomon seal. Uh, lungwort, lungwort, 
Uh, this one here is Mrs. Moon, a very common variety where it has very distinctive spots, silver spots on the foliage. Some varieties are essentially silver but maybe a little bit of green, but this one has very distinctive silver spots, Mrs. Moon. So with the lungworts you have the attractive foliage, but you also have attractive flowers. And they bloom in the spring. They're currently blooming here in central Iowa. And the flowers can be white, pink, or blue. But they do require a moist soil. They're not fond of dry conditions. They're not, uh, they're not drought tolerant. So it should be a moist, well-drained soil for the lungworts. Uh, this is false Solomon seal. False Solomon seal, also native to Iowa. Again, you have this long, arching, unbranched stem. But on this one, the flowers are clustered at the very end of the actual flower stalk. They're kind of a creamy white. And they also form berries, but they're turned out bright red by late summer. False Solomon seal. But very similar to the previous species. A golden poppy or solandin poppy where you have these bright yellow flowers. Very, very showy. Very pretty. <coughs> and the actual foliage is shaped somewhat like an oak leaf because it's, it's various lobed. And this plant will die back usually by midsummer, especially if we have a dry summer. <coughs> golden poppy or solandin poppy. Uh, trilliums, native to Iowa. Several species are actually native to Iowa. This is a white one, the great white trillium, probably the most common. And with all the trilliums, uh, all the plant parts come in three. You have three petals, three sepals, three leaves, hence trillium. And here we have a pink form. But the white by far is the most common and actually fairly easy to find in the nursery trade too, uh, the trilliums. <coughs> Moving to trees and shrubs that like partial shade or tolerate partial shade. Uh, the first one is very common in Iowa. It goes by various common names, either serviceberry or juneberry or shad bush. This can be a uh, large shrub or a small tree. Currently blooming white flowers in the spring. Followed by fruit that look very similar to a blueberry. They ripen in June, hence the name Juneberry. And they are definitely edible, if you can get enough. They make a nice pie. And then in the fall, they have a nice fall color. The fall color can vary from yellow to orange to red. Most commonly kind of a brownish orange. A service berry or Juneberry. Very, very common, a very nice ornamental. Here we have Carpinus, or American Hornbeam. This is an understory tree. It's native to Iowa. It's very, very common in the understory. So it's very, very shade tolerant. Grows very, very slowly. It's fairly short, maybe 20, 25 feet. But it will also grow in the sun. So it prefers shade, but it also does well in the sun. And it's only going to get to be 20, 25 feet. So if you have an area where you have utility wires, this might be a good place to put it. Or if you have a lot of shade, this is a very shade tolerant tree. American hornbeam. Kind of hard to find in the nursery trade um, because it grows so slowly. But a really nice native tree, American hornbeam. Here we have the red bud, native to Iowa, currently blooming here in central Iowa. It's amazing how many red buds are actually out there. You don't notice them during the summer because they're kind of nondescript. But when they're in bloom, you, you notice them because they have those striking pinkish purple flowers. Very, very pretty. They're actually native to southern Iowa and further south. But they'll grow as far north as southern Minnesota. But if you, if you, if you plant these, one thing you might want to ask is, were they grown from a northern seed source? Because that's important here in Iowa. Because if they actually grew these from seed collected in Oklahoma or Missouri, they may not be hardy here in Iowa. So make sure if those are from a northern seed source. Ask about that. 
Here we have another native tree, pagoda dogwood, actually native to eastern Iowa. And the first thing you notice about pagoda dogwood is the branches are in tiers. They have a horizontal branching, hence pagoda dogwood. It's kind of a chubby tree. It's about maybe 20, 25 feet wide and about 20 feet tall. It does bloom in the spring. The flowers are kind of a creamy white. And the odor is somewhat unpleasant. <laughs> but if you don't really go up that close to it, it's, it's OK. Then it has these berries that go from green to red to bl uh, bluish black. And then in the fall, the foliage will turn kind of a reddish purple. So you have that distinct horizontal branching habit, which is nice to have. Then you have the flowers in the spring, then you have the fruit, and then in the fall, you have that reddish purple foliage. So quite ornamental. As far as this plant, though, it's kind of picky or finicky as far as the site that it requires. It would prefer morning sun, afternoon shade. It really doesn't like hot, dry sites, so preferably morning sun, afternoon shade, and a moist, well-drained soil. If you put this in a hot, dry, location, it's not going to do well. It really doesn't. So preferably morning sun, afternoon shade. Here's Father Gilla. Father Gilla. You don't see it much. In the spring, it has these little short bottle brush-like flowers that are white. They have a faint honey scent to them. So you have that in the spring. And then in the fall, the foliage varies from yellow to orange to red, to purple. So you have the nice fall color. Father Gila. A witch hazel, common witch hazel, also native to Iowa. This can be a large shrub or a small tree. And this blooms in the fall, in October, November, into maybe early December. And the petals are quite strap-like. And on warm days, they unfurl completely. And then on cold days, they curl up real tight. So in, in addition to the flowers, you also have a very nice fall color. The leaves will turn a nice golden yellow. So you have the fall foliage, and then you have the flowers. There's also a vernal witch hazel, which blooms in February and March. It's a little bit different. It's not native to Iowa but it blooms basically in February and March. And on that one, the flowers vary from yellow to kind of a brownish orange. Smooth hydrangea, very, very common in Iowa. It grows about four or five feet tall. And then you have these big white clusters of flowers on top of the plants. And oftentimes, they get so heavy, they kind of flop over. That's very common with these, but very, very common been used for many, many years. Here we have Itea, Virginia Sweet Spire. You don't see this very much either. Uh, it does quite well in partial shade. And it does flower in the spring, typically like June, so maybe late spring, early summer. And it has these white flowers. Uh, they're slightly fragrant. And then in the fall, the fall foliage varies from yellow to orange to kind of a reddish purple. So Itea, or Virginia Sweet Spire. And this one here is uh, Henry's Garnet, is a variety. And it turns a nice garnet red in the fall. Japanese Caria, Japanese Caria. Uh, you don't see this very often either. You have these long, arching green stems, and then it flowers in June, typically. So again, late spring, early summer. Uh, flowers can be single or they can be double. There is a double form on this, too. So Japanese caria, but kind of a, a long, arching type shrub. Here's an evergreen that does well in the shade. Most evergreens don't. Uh, this one here is Russian cypress. Grows about a foot tall and spreads quite nicely. The foliage reminds me of the arborvitae, which is soft to the touch. This is not prickly at all, like the junipers are. This is soft foliage. 
Russian Cyprus. And so if you have a shade where you want evergreen, you might try this. It grows about a foot tall and spreads quite nicely. But it has to be a well-drained soil. They don't like wet, poorly drained sites. Here's another native tree, understory tree, ironwood is a common name for it. it. Grows about 30 foot tall, very slow growing, but another nice native tree for areas where you don't want a huge tree, ironwood. Another name is American hop hornbeam because the fruit resemble hops. Hence, American hop hornbeam is another common name for this tree. But it grows about 30 foot tall and sometimes has a fairly nice fall color, maybe a yellow color but grows very, very slowly and kind of hard to find in nursery trade. Uh, rhododendrons. Uh, there are hundreds, thousands of varieties. In Iowa, we can only grow a handful. Most are not reliably hardy in Iowa. This is the most common one, PJM. Very, very common, currently blooming right now. And the flowers are kind of a pinkish purple. Now, at the least, they should get at least three hours of sun no less than that, to really bloom well, at least three hours. They can tolerate four or five hours of sun, but at least three hours. They don't want complete shade. They really don't. That's kind of a misconception. They really like to have a little bit of sun, preferably three, four, five hours of sun to really bloom well. And if you don't like the pinkish purple flower with the PJM, uh, this one is a glow. It's a sister of PJM. And the flowers on this are a true pink. So if you prefer pink, you might look for a glow, A-G-L-O. It blooms about a week after PJM and has a true pink flower. It's not pinkish purple, it's pink. Now with, with all the rhododendrons in Iowa, we do have to modify the soil. They do require an acid soil, which we don't have. So we have to modify the soil. And the best way to do that is simply to dig a fairly a wide hole, but a fairly shallow hole, and then take that soil and mix that with Canadian peat that you could buy at any garden center. That Canadian peat is very, very acidic. So if you mix that with soil, half soil, half peat, and then backfill with that mix, that should give you the right pH. You should be in good shape. Uh, they also insist on a well-drained soil. They do not like wet, poorly drained sites. If they're put in a, in a wet site, they'll get a root rot and they will die invariably. So it has to be a well-drained soil. I typically, when I plant these, I'll put them so the actual soil ball may be a couple inches above the surrounding terrain to make sure it's not sitting in a hole and make sure it has good drainage. Uh, alpine currant, uh, one of the first plants to leaf out in the spring, grows about four to six feet tall. It tolerates pruning very, very well, and we commonly use this as a formal pruned hedge because it tolerates pruning very, very well. Alpine currant. Here we have the ewes, they'll grow in sun or shade. Uh, again, they require though, a well-drained soil. They don't like wet sites. And again, this plant also tolerates uh, pruning quite well too. And so you can prune these into formal hedges. Use or taxis. Canadian hemlock. This is a big tree that can be 30, 40, 50 feet tall. But it does require a moist, well-drained soil, a cool site. It does not do well in an open, windy, dry site, so you have to choose your site very carefully. On campus at Iowa State, we'll typically plant these on the east side of large buildings on campus. So it has the morning sun, afternoon shade, tends to be cooler and more moist. But I would not plant these in a windy, open site. They don't do well. Moving to the viburnums. This one is arrowwood viburnum, which is also native to Iowa. It grows about six to eight foot tall. It will grow in sun or shade. In the spring, it has these white flowers and clusters, followed by these blue berries that turn this blue color typically in mid to late summer. 
Arrowwood viburnum, native to Iowa, very, very easy to grow. And sometimes they'll develop a nice fall color, sometimes yellow, sometimes reddish purple. And finally, black hall viburnum, which is a large shrub or a small tree. Again, the uh, creamy white flowers in the spring of the year. And then they have these uh, bluish fruit that are actually edible. Uh, they're quite good. And they also have kind of a reddish purple fall color also. Uh, that's the end of my slides. Could we have the lights? Are there any spirea which tolerate shade? Not very well, really. Uh, they would do best in partial or full sun. And in heavy shade or partial shade, they're probably not going to do very well. Could you define partial sun, partial shade? Okay. Define partial sun, partial okay. shade. I would say uh, partial shade is where they receive maybe two or three hours of light or sunlight during the day. Uh, heavy shade is where hardly anything, maybe an hour, maybe two. Uh, partial sun, three to six hours of sun per day. And then full sun, anything beyond eight hours of sun. Those are not, those are kind of rough definitions. When is the best time to transplant ferns, like ostrich ferns? Probably spring would be the best time. And they're pretty tough and actually pretty easy. What would you grow between the crevices of flagstone, a flagstone patio that is under an oak tree? Boy, that's difficult. I'm not sure that you can. Your best bet might be moss. <laughs> uh, I don't know anything that's going to be that shade tolerant that might tolerate some traffic as far as foot traffic. So I can't think of anything really, except for the moss. Will Martagon lily survive in total sun? I mean, and I hope I'm pronouncing it that correctly. Yeah, I think they would have a tough time doing it in full sun. Uh, they really like the partial shade. Um, they're so difficult to establish anyway that I, I think in full sun they probably would not do very well. I'm not familiar with also four. Is that A L S O four? Are you familiar with that? Will also for keep the soil acidified appropriately for blue hydrangeas. Am I, am I? Hmm. Aluminum sulfate. Oh, oh aluminum, aluminum sulfate. sulfate. Oh. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you want to use aluminum sulfate. Um, it's actually the aluminum in the soil that makes the flowers the various colors. Um, and so when you apply aluminum sulfate, that's going to lower the soil pH, but also supply the aluminum which is needed for that blue color. So it's actually the, the aluminum, which is quite unusual, that causes that. It's a very complex plant reaction, but it's actually the, the aluminum that does it. What is a good source for wildflowers, such as shooting stars? Ah, uh, well. I would probably try some of the, uh, hey, that sounds good, Project Green Sale, okay. Uh, there are actually some companies that specialize in native grasses and wildflowers. Uh, for example, Ion Exchange in Harpers Ferry, I'm not sure if they carry the shooting star, but they have native plants and you can buy sometimes seed or plants and they're in Harpers Ferry. And they have a website, and they have a little catalog that they send out too. So I would try some of the uh, either local garden centers or some of the mail or catalogs. Can Father Gilla take a west location, or is that too much hot sun? Actually, the Father Gillas will take a lot of sun, uh, more so than, than uh, most people credit them. So actually, they'll, they'll grow well in the sun. Against a building, would that work still? That might be a little bit hot for it. Um, if we're maybe out away from a building, maybe in the yard per se, and not close to a building, which might intensify the heat, probably better. How about ITEA? 
I actually, ITEA actually does quite well in the sun too. Do other hydrangea do well in shade? Um, the uh, paniculata is pretty well in the shade too, so you could try that. But partial shade, I would say for, for the hydrangeas, maybe at a minimum three hours of sun. So they're kind of on the edge. But if they get like three hours of sun, they should do okay. Is there a way of preparing soil under trees where you have roots and other problems? That's one of the big problems with, uh, with shady areas because um, if you were to scrape off what grass would be there, you're going to find this mass of roots and they're just below the surface. Uh, so you can't go in there with a tiller because you'd be damaging the root system of the tree. And I don't think you could actually physically do it just because of all the roots. So you can't really do it. On the other hand, you really can't bring in additional soil. And the reason for that is if you brought in, let's say, four or five inches of soil to make planting easier, you'd be covering the roots with too much soil. And some of those roots may actually suffocate and they may die. So you could end up injuring your tree or your shrubs. Mm -hmm. um, most tree roots are actually in the top foot of soil, the vast majority maybe 75, 80 percent are in that top foot of soil. That's where the water is, that's where the nutrients are, and that's where the oxygen, they have to breathe. So you can't bring in like four or five, six inches of soil because you may up, end up killing your trees and shrub. So you have to kind of get rid of what may be there, maybe with either a roundup or just kind of digging it up very carefully. And then you just have to kind of place your things as best you can because you're going to be able to, you're going to find roots where you just simply can't plant and you may have to move maybe a foot away and plant something. But it's just kind of trial and error, basically. Mm -hmm. But you do think it's okay to plant under trees? It's not well, sure. too much competition for No, them. Okay. that's okay. okay. You just can't really change the environment that much, though. How about uh, oak leaf hydrangea? How well does it do in the shade? Well, it, it does okay, but I'd probably give it maybe three, four, or five hours of sun. That should be fine. And how about vines? Do you suggest certain vines for shade? Certain vines for shade. Um, it asks about ivy. Yeah. You could grow uh, Virginia, uh, Virginia creeper or woodbine. It's actually native to Iowa. And it does quite well in the shade. It also does quite well in the sun. Um, it actually has these tendrils that have like suction cups on them. So they will climb buildings. And when you go to like Iowa State, it's not ivy, it's Virginia creeper that grows on the buildings. Um, and it will climb 20, 25 feet tall. It's hard to get off, though, once it's attached to the building. So you would not want to use this, for example, on a typical home because if it gets underneath the siding, it's quite destructive that way. So it has limited use. But it actually makes a nice ground cover in the shade. If you take a walk in the woods, you may actually see it carpeting the ground. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't let it climb the trees, it makes a nice ground cover. And at climbing hydrangea, do you have anything to say about that? It's kind of iffy in Iowa. Um, definitely not reliably hardy in northern Iowa. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something that you might experiment with in central Iowa. Um, you don't see it very much. What grows well under a pine tree? Is there a difference between a pine tree and the other trees that you mentioned? Well, there really isn't that much of a difference. Uh, I think the concern is that underneath a pine tree or a spruce tree, the soil might be too acid. It's typically not. It really isn't. Uh, soil pH changes very, very slowly. And even though that pine tree might have been there maybe 40, 50 years, that's really not enough time to really make this soil real acidic. So it really shouldn't be a problem. What can you tell us about mycorrhiza fungi and how okay. to apply? Am I, am I not pronouncing that correctly? Okay. That's kind of a um, controversial topic. Um, the mycorrhiza fungi may help as far as the plant grow, but on the other hand, if you have very poor soil, and you apply the mycorrhiza to the soil, my guess would be that the mycorrhizal will, will not survive long term, so they really won't benefit the tree that much. So what we typically say as far as the mycorrhiza, the most important things 
are to plant the tree and shrub correctly first. Don't plant it too deep. Make sure the top of the soil ball is at or slightly above the surrounding soil. So make sure it's well planted. Okay? And if you have a really difficult site, choose plants that are basically very tolerant. Uh, for example, green ash, honey locust, they're very tolerant trees. They almost go anywhere. And so if you have a really terrible site, you might consider these very adaptable trees. And then as far as watering, make sure they're watered well. So don't neglect the obvious as far as planting the right depth, making sure they're kept well watered. As far as the mycorrhiza, the, the research, there's really no consensus as far as what's been done recently. In some cases, they find that the mycorrhiza do benefit the trees quite a bit. In other cases, they find very little or no benefit. So there's really no consensus. So the main thing is make sure the other things are done correctly. What is the best way to plant redbud seeds? Redbud seeds. Okay. Well, uh, they have a hard seed coat. And so the first thing you have to do is somehow break the seed coat. And you could, if you had sulfuric acid, you could put those in sulfuric acid for like 20 to 30 minutes, and that should eat away the seed coat. Or you can boil water and then put the seeds in boiling water for one minute. And then that should break the seed coat. Okay? Then once you've done that, then you have to uh, stratify the seed, which means you have to put it where it's given moist conditions and a cool temperature. And so what I would do is get a small container, like a um, cottage cheese container, and some coarse sand and some peat, and moisten that lightly, and then put a layer in your container, and then sprinkle your seeds on top, and then cover with more material. Uh, put it on your lid, punch a couple holes in it, and then place it in a refrigerator for 90 to 120 days. And that approximate winter. That's what it needs to go to actually germinate. This works terrific, actually. It works real easy. Um, uh, we did this, we do this in class at Iowa State, where you grow certain seeds from certain plants from seed. And it actually works very, very nicely, very easy. Then you take them out and they're ready to go. They're ready to go. Just like that. We, I, we have another question, right? What about just leaving them outside over the winter? That works. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. That's the way nature does it. Right. But this way, you're doing it where you have things under control, more uniform. Now, how do you gather those seeds in the first place? In the fall. Just go out just there when the pods are brown, pick them off. Uh -huh. And they're small, brown, little chip, kind of like a lima bean. And uh -huh. uh, they're ready to go once they've been treated. When is the best time to transplant native bleeding hearts? Bleeding hearts. Well, um, typically I'd probably transplant those in August or late September. I mean, uh, August or early September. And what about hellebores? Hellebores are, are nice. Um, they're more difficult to grow. Um, you have to have a really nice site, otherwise they won't do well. Uh, they insist on a well-drained soil. It cannot be a wet site. Uh, they also insist on some protection. Uh, they don't like to be in a windy, open, exposed site. So if you have maybe a courtyard or someplace where it's fairly sheltered, it's in partial shade, a nice, well-drained soil, they do fairly nicely. But if it's out in the open, uh, they typically don't do as well. So they're kind of finicky in that way. Does a juga tolerate dry shade? Yep, pretty well. Yeah, it does. It actually does not like wet soils. So a juga or bugle weed will tolerate dry soils quite well. They don't toler uh, tolerate wet soils. They really don't. They may, get, they may get a crown rot if we have a wet soil. So dry soil, yes. Wet soil, no. How about wild ginger? Uh, wild ginger would prefer a well-drained moist soil, but they'll tolerate drought on occasion. We had uh, some Canadian ginger at a site where I work that last summer in our drought just <coughs> went to pieces. <laughs> it all turned brown and crackly and, and uh, I, did I, 
I didn't know whether it had some kind of a fungus or a problem other than the drought or whether the drought brought on the other problem. Or it may have been just the dry conditions. Just the dry but conditions. But hopefully it's going to come back and be just fine this it seems spring. to be doing better than okay. I thought it would, yeah. Go I ahead. think it's just one way to tolerate the dry conditions maybe is to die back a little bit prematurely. Mm -hmm. And sweet woodruff, does it like dry shade? Uh, sweet woodruff will tolerate dry shade, yeah. How do bluebells spread? By seed and very effectively, very efficiently. So if, you have, if you've mulched your area or if you have a lot of leaf cover, is there a way that it's going to spread anyway or do you have to It'd be more difficult. getting that to the soil? It'd be more I mean, difficult because you don't have the really exposure <coughs> to, the, to the soil. You don't have mm -hmm. that seed soil contact. Uh, most likely the seed's not going to germinate very well in the wood mulch. Mm -hmm. So I suppose you could actually harvest the little fruits mm -hmm. before they split open and maybe sprinkle those on maybe a bare ground, some bare ground. Mm -hmm. But in the mulch, they're probably not going to spread very well. Are most of the perennials adapted to, to partial shade available in local nurseries? Or they, they should be. Many of them are. Uh, they should be. And if you, that'd be my first choice. If you can find it locally, obviously buy it locally. Um, if you can't find what you're looking for, then you do have the catalogs. And the catalogs tend to have a wider selection. So if you're looking for a specific variety, you may have better luck with the catalog. But I would check locally first. OK. Do we have any more questions? We've just about gone through our questions. I'm, I would like to make a couple of announcements. Thank you very much, Richard. You're welcome.